Shalom everyone. This is again Amir Tzalfati from Galilee, from Israel. We have an exciting update today in regards to the events uh, in Gaza and of course in the rest of the Middle East. Amazing, amazing things. Uh, we're going to start with Gaza because I believe many, many of you are wondering what is going on. Well, I'm, un I'm, I'm afraid to tell you that um, that which you have in mind or that which you think was going on is far more severe than what really went on on the ground. Um, where should I begin? Uh, first of all, you need to understand Gaza Strip is the most populated area in the world. We're talking about two million people that live in a very small strip of land and you're talking about people that are um, having a regime which is officially a terror organization. You understand that um, these terrorists commit terrorist activity almost on a daily basis against Israel, but not only against Israel. The Egyptians can tell you uh, that which is also aimed towards them. But beyond that, you need to understand that the biggest terror that these people are using, the Hamas, is against their own people. Gaza Strip is a place that became the darling of the world from the year 2005 when Israel pulled out of that place and, and basically cleared all Israelis from the Strip over there, leaving the Palestinians to mind their business and rule themselves there. The world started um, um, giving the Gaza Strip billions of dollars. And when I say billions, I'm talking real billions of dollars and unfortunately not even a single new school, new factory, uh, new kindergarten, new hospital, none of these were uh, built by these monies, but th that money, if anything, what Hamas has been doing with all the money since Hamas is ruling and is, is getting the money, is depriving the money from the welfare of its own people and has been using it to build terror tunnels, to buy weapons, store weapons, and develop weapons that will be aimed towards Israel whenever they feel like. And guess what? After the failure of their attempt to show the world that they are having an, a, a peaceful protest on May 14, we proved that they were wrong because all the terrorists, all the, those who got killed were actually their own terrorists. And after that failure, and in lieu of what was going on with Iran, that Iran was just being defeated almost every week on the ground, the Iranians started pushing the Hamas to start their own shenanigans in the south. The Iranians were giving them instructions. The Hamas leaders were actually admitting that they're in touch with the Iranians on a daily basis. They're saying that they get orders from Iran and money from Iran and weapons from Iran. So when Iran is 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 not you know able to fight Israel Iran is is of course trying to use its own proxies around but this is nothing new Hamas was there for the longest time Hezbollah is in Lebanon for the longest time and and I'll, I'll, I'll get into the the question of is it really truly peaceful right now in preparation for Ezekiel's war and I'll tell you why I believe it is but in a few seconds I'll talk about it. I just want you to understand, folks, that every few years, couple of years, might be two, three, four years, there's a round of violence. They shoot rockets. We pound them back. They scream for help. We get to some understandings of you're quiet, we'll be quiet, and that's it. And that is exactly what happened. It took 21 hours from the moment they started shooting rockets, almost nearly uh, 100 rockets and mortar shells, um, towards these nearby Israeli towns and villages around the Gaza Strip. And um, when Israel started retaliating, and I'm talking about attacking 65 very, very prime targets that, just like with Iran, we waited for them to do something stupid for us to go and attack uh, factories where they make drones, factories where they make uh, rockets, um, terror tunnels, training centers, um, um, watchtowers and observation um, headquarters. We just destroyed it. They were so 
are shocked by the Israeli surgical attack. We never even killed one Palestinian, yet we destroyed everything that belongs to Hamas. They immediately called the Egyptians and screamed, please help us stop the Israelis. You see, they start shooting rockets. And when we retaliate, they are begging the Egyptians to talk to us to stop. Israel decided to say, okay, well, if you want us to stop and you stop shooting, we'll stop retaliating. It's very simple. By the way, this is the entire story of the conflict in the Middle East. If they let down their weapons and live in peace with us, Israel will not need to retaliate or to have preemptive strikes. None whatsoever. If Iranians stay in Iran... And if uh, Lebanese stay in Lebanon, and if Palestinians stay where they belong, then there will be no more war in the Middle East. The problem in the Middle East is not that Israel wants to take Gaza, Israel wants to take Beirut, Israel wants to take Damascus, Israel wants to take um, countries around us or capitals around us. No, all we want is for them to stop. In fact, the name of the Israeli military is IDF. Israel's defense forces. We are determined to defend ourselves and when we see danger and when we see plotting against us and storing weapons against us, we go and take care of business. So when, if they stop, you know, we, we, um, we always said that if the uh, Arabs will stop fighting, then there will be peace. If the Israelis will stop fighting, then there will no, no, not be Israel anymore. That's the difference. The difference is that they're trying to take what's not theirs. They're trying to replace us when we're not trying to replace them. This is what it's all about. So we told the Palestinians, if you hold back your weapons and stop firing, we will definitely not retaliate anymore. And that is exactly what happened. That's it. Not even a single Israeli pe person died apart from two different places where one is a soccer stadium and one is a, the backyard of somebody's uh, house. A, a, nothing happened. The Iron Dome destroyed 95 of the rockets in the air and the few that fell of them, only two hit something. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we had less damage and less casualties than Chicago had on Memorial Day. Did you know that? My point is simple. The world media is trying to make it look big because it serves the interests of the Palestinians and Hamas in particular to say, look, when we want, there's a war, and when we want, there's peace. They tell the world that they hold the power or the key to the safety and security of Israel, when in reality, they know that they begged for, for the Egyptians to immediately intermediate and, and, and ask Israel to stop. And they don't tell that to their people because one of the strategies of the Palestinians, as well as so many Arab countries around us, is don't tell your people the truth. Hold the truth from your people. You know that so many Palestinians are actually following the Israeli um, media sources because they know if we want to know the truth, we'll go to hear what the Israelis say. Our people will lie to our faces every time. You know, you understand it. If it's up to the Arabs, they won all the wars against Israel. And yet, 1948, they lost. In 1967, they lost. In 1973, they lost. And they mark those days as days of disaster, although they claim to have won. It's very interesting. Very, by the way, very typical. Um, the whole idea of lying in order to achieve the goals of Islam is permitted. This taqiyya is, is very, very simple. And if you don't understand that, you'll never understand why an agreement with Iran will never even worth the paper that it's signed on. Because they are deceiving the world as part of their own religion. That Anything that serves their interest will be okay. If lying is serving your interest, if deceiving is serving your interest, if hiding is serving your interest, that's fine. 
They don't hold themselves as, oh, we lied, we're busted. No, we said the truth. For us, the truth is that we need to lie to you. That's the truth. And Hamas is now telling his own people, and Islamic Jihad in Palestinian territories is telling his own people, we won, we started, and we ended it, and we are holding the keys for all that. This is baloney. Let me tell you between us, Israel can destroy the Hamas, Jihad, or even the entire Palestinian Authority in 20 minutes. We're able to do that. And the reason why we don't destroy Hamas is because we prefer Hamas ruling the Palestinians, the two millions there, than us ruling those two millions there. We've been there for 30 years. We did that. We did from 1967 to 1996, 95, Israel ruled Gaza. I was part of the military government in the West Bank in Gaza. I was the deputy governor of Jericho when Israel still was there. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel doesn't want to rule of two million Palestinians in Gaza. We don't want that responsibility. So we need to always hit Hamas as, as hard as we can, yet keep them still intact for them to be able to govern their own people. And we trust that the world will understand that there is a greater need to monitor what's done with monies that goes to the Gaza Strip because all they do, we just destroyed another terror tunnel. It took them forever. It took them hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to build that particular tunnel, and we just destroyed it. We're, we find more and more and more tunnels, and if every tunnel would have not been built, that money could have been used for one more hospital, one more school, one more kindergarten, enhancing and, 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 and improving the life of their own people. But you understand they don't want that. As long as they show the world how poor they are, how bad it is, how, how terrible things are, that's when they get the world's attention. That's when they still play the I'm, I'm, I'm very, very unfortunate card. That's when, when somebody is, 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 is really taking advantage of me card. This is it. Where in reality, Israel is no longer in Gaza for the longest time. They are responsible for their own people, but they do nothing for their own people. That which happened in Gaza is just nothing. Um, let, me, let me reiterate. It means nothing. We could destroy them if we wanted. At this time, we prefer not to. At this time, we prefer to hit some of their infrastructures that are related to terror attacks, but we do not want to completely topple the, Palis the Hamas regime because we need them to rule their own people. We do not want to go into their, uh, uh, their territory that, there in Gaza and, and rule them. We just don't. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the situation. Israel provides Gaza with electricity, with food, with medicine, with, with supplies. We are the lifeline of the Palestinians over there. And guess what? A couple of their rockets hit power lines, and actually three power lines that provide power to the Gaza Strip actually were destroyed by their own rockets. They, at the end of the day, sat in the dark because of the rockets that they were shooting. So you see, they burn areas where we give them, um, you know, we give them food and medicines, and we, they burn that. So, and then it's almost like somebody is suicidal. Somebody is taking a knife and is cutting himself, because everything that they attack are the things that actually are there to pr provide better life for them. But they want to be seen as poor, as needy, as uh, persecuted, and that's that's what they want. And it's not working anymore. It's not working. There's a new sheriff in town. His name is Donald Trump. President Trump told the Palestinians, stop acting as victims. When you pay the terrorist families every month, more than half of your annual budget goes to pay to families of terrorists. You guys are encouraging terrorism. Somebody says, well, if I commit suicide, my family will have good life. So I'm going to do that for the sake of my family because they'll get salaries the, the, you know, the rest of their lives. You must understand that President Trump put an end to this. And following his leadership, the Saudis, 
in the, in the um, Bahrainis, in the United Arab Emirates, and more and more open their eyes to understand that what they do by giving them money is actually preserving the situation and not improving it. And, and, and it's, it will not lead them anywhere. So that's as far as the Gaza thing. Now, if you think that because of that, the incident that happened two days ago uh, that lasted for 20-something hours, it's not safe in Israel, then kiss that thought goodbye. Chicago is less safer than any place around the Gaza Strip where Israelis live. You must understand Israel is not having the danger of annihilation anymore. Most of you don't even understand that the Israelis used to live from 1948 to 1973. We used to live with a feeling that tomorrow we might not even be there anymore. We're talking about major wars, major wars where thousands of soldiers died that took years to, to recover from. That's what war is all about. What we see today is prosperity unprecedented, the lowest unemployment ever, the, the best the rate of the Israeli currency right now is one of the strongest in the world. What we see today, ladies and gentlemen, is an amazing situation of Israel thriving. World leaders are just standing in line to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu. We are leading in so many areas around the world right now. That is not any atmosphere of lack of peace and stability. In fact, more and more companies like Apple and Samsung and companies like Intel and companies like, um, you know, just name them, Microsoft, they are all investing hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in Israel. If they thought that it's not peaceful here, that it's dangerous here, they would have never done that. You understand that Israel has never had it better, never ever in the history of our 70 years independence Israel had it better than we have it today. The problem is that the power of social media today takes a little fly and makes it look like an elephant. People downloaded all the red alert of the rockets flying into Israel. Whenever rockets fly, there's a red alert and people downloaded the app and they hear the app, you know, you know, buzzing and more and more rockets and they all oh, Israel is under attack. Israel is about to be destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, most of the Israelis, 99.8% of the Israelis didn't hear anything from what is being reported because we don't live around the Gaza Strip. You, you must understand that. Now, of course, we watch the news and of course we, we understand what's going on. But for Israel, the Gaza in conflict is not an existential threat. It's a headache. Yes, I agree. I give that one to them. But nothing more than that. We care more about the Palestinians that live in Gaza than their own people. Our headache right now is not how to stop terrorism. Our headache right now is how to give the Gazans better life so they stop terrorism. It's, it's taking care of them that we, we are dealing with right, right, right now, not destroying them. You must understand that the eyes of the Israeli military right now is not on Gaza. It's on what's going on in Syria. It's on the Iranian entrenchment there. It's on the Russian entrenchments. It's, it's on the, 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 the Turkish entrenchment there. Now, so that as far as the Gaza Strip is concerned. I know that a lot of people are trying to push the idea that the Ezekiel war is not around the corner because Ezekiel is talking about safe and secure Israel. I'm telling you, what Ezekiel saw in his mind is, is exactly what I am seeing today in my own country. That's why I'm so excited. I'm not afraid. I'm excited to see all of these things. But I do want you to understand, I don't believe that there will be a different or another war before Ezekiel because we're watching the alliance of Ezekiel being made and, and, and formed before our very eyes. 
And I'm telling you, as an Israeli, as a bo- as not only born again spirit filled brother in the Lord, but also as a military person, as as an Israeli civilian, at the moment right now, as a as a, a, a citizen of the state of Israel, what I see from here, you cannot see from Europe or from America or from Australia. You will never be able to understand how peaceful it is here unless you live here. Unless you now, sometimes. I know that some people are trying to get some attention online. So they go live and they report, rocket fell here and a rocket was sent there and and there's, you know, Israel is under attack. Baloney. This is why I wasn't even part of all of that because I knew it's a matter of day. They are going to beg for us to stop and that's what happened. That's it. I just hope that we're not being dragged always by so many people to unnecessary hysteria, unnecessary sensationalism. What happened with the Palestinians is nothing but an attempt to distract us from the real danger, and that's the coming storm from the north. That's the problem, the coming storm. We live in the calm before the storm, and the storm, the Bible says, will come from the utmost parts of the north. It is coming from Russia, it is coming from Syria, it is coming from from Turkey and from Iran. It will come, and trust me, that is a war that is going to threaten the existence of Israel. That's what I call a war. What we have now is nothing. Little couple rockets from Gaza or from some... I don't know, militias in in Golan Heights, they're nothing. It's nothing. It's not even considered a war. Israel's eyes are not on that. We are watching the formation of that which is much bigger, much greater, and much more threatening than the Palestinians. We have to understand that. I do not believe that any one of you that it doesn't live here will ever be able to understand that the same way I do. That's why all I can do is report from here and being here and just tell you guys, either you trust someone who live here or you just trust other people who speculate day and night on other wars that might come. And, you know, that's, you know, be careful. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is not afraid of Hezbollah. Yes, they have rockets. So what? We have Iron Dome. Yes, they they might have money. So what? We're stronger. You need to understand Hezbollah is not posing an existential threat on Israel, nor Hamas. Those are terrorist organizations. These are not countries. These are not armies. These are not tanks and aircrafts and, and ballistic missiles. These are not. They are a bunch of spoiled brats that are getting money to fight Israel and they don't have any other thing to do, any better thing to do in their life. They've been brainwashed religiously, and they are financially in a need, and they're being taken advantage by leaders such as the Ayatollahs and such as the Palestinian leadership. And, and that's it. They're, they're, they're killing themselves while their leaders are becoming the multi-billionaires. You know, the Palestinian president is, is a multi-millionaire. Why? Because half of the money that goes to the Palestinian Authority goes to his own pocket. And the Palestinians told me that. Not that I didn't know about it before. Because when we formed the Palestinian Authority at the time, I remember Israel used to gather all the taxes and and pay to the Palestinians. We would collect the taxes and then give it to the Palestinians. And guess what? The Palestinians gave me personally two bank accounts. One that is the public account of the Palestinian treasury and one that is a private account of their own people. So we know what's going on. They can bluff and, and, and deceive the rest of the world, not us. And they know that we know that. That's why they, they try to silence our voice, but it's not working. So this is the Gaza shenanigan. Calm down, relax. Israel is not threatened by that. It's a headache. We take care of it. Every few years, they want to show that they exist. They want to show their own people. By the way, 
half of the reasons why they do that is not to, to attack Israel. They know they can never win. They need to show their own people. Look what we did. We're strong. We are leaders. Blah, blah, blah. And that's it. It's for their own personal internal reasons. Nothing more than that. So we need not to be dragged into unnecessary hysteria. We need to calm down. Israel is safe. Look, look behind me. Not even F-16s are taking off right now, which means there's really nothing. I want to tell you something. I am not afraid. And when I travel around the world, trust me, I'm way more afraid than when I'm here in my own country. So it has to be clear. So we're done with Gaza right now. We're done with Gaza. Let's not talk about it right now. I hope you understand that. But let's talk about Turkey right now. Amazing things are happening right now. Turkey just announced uh, that they're considering not allowing the um, they're considering not allowing the um, uh, not allowing the uh, Americans access to the Incirlik Air Base, which is uh, a, an air base uh, that is located in the south eastern parts of of, uh, of Turkey right now. It's, it's a few miles away from uh, the border um, with, um, with um, Syria. This is just so you to know that. We're talking about an air base that is the home of the 10th Air Wing of Syria. And also, believe it or not, it's also, it has a U.S. Air Force uh, uh, complement of about 5,000 men. And according to some sources, um, I was told that there's about 50 nuclear warheads that the American army is having in its own complement right there in its own compound within the Incherlik, Incherlik Air Base. Can you imagine? The Turks, we just found out, sold technology that Israel gave them, knowing that Turkey is a member of NATO, it will never breach any of the security. They sold it to Iran. The Turks right now are not to be trusted. They are against America. They are against NATO. They are, of course, against Israel. It started with that. Now, the Americans realize we can't trust them anymore. So what the Americans just said is, we're not sure we want to sell them the F-35s. Although we, at the time, we thought that Turkey could take a part of this project of the F-35, that the, the Americans are now saying we may not do that. And the Turks immediately uh, decided, okay, so we're running uh, uh, to buy uh, the other stealth uh, jet fighter made by, um, made by the, uh, uh, the Syrians, uh, the um, Russians. And I'm, of course, I'm, I'm talking uh, about uh, the Sukhoi stealth jet fighter that the, the Syrian, the uh, Russians are making right now. So we're, we're, talking about, um, we're talking about something very, very interesting. We're talking about how the Syrians are thinking about buying, um, purchasing the Su-57 Instead of the F-35, the Sukhoi 57, of course, it's not as good as the F-35, but they want to actually strengthen their alliance with Russia and tell the world we're no longer on the American side. So America is in a big problem right now because it has to remove those nuclear warheads from within Turkey. And it has to do it in a way that, um, you know, it won't... Uh, cause some issues over there. Ladies and gentlemen, so we've got that tension between America and, and Turkey right now. The alliance between the Turks and the Russians getting stronger and stronger. That is exactly what Russia wanted. Russia wants to sell weapons. Russia was banking on the Iranian deal that they will make hundreds of billions of dollars and so they will be able to purchase Russian weapons. The Russian weapon industry and the military industry is the jackpot of the Russian uh, uh, economy right now since the, the prices of oil are so low and since America is now a big competitor in the oil and the gas export, the Russians want to invest heavily in selling weapon systems to Iran, to Turkey, 
to Syria, and of course to other countries around. And now, now we see why, why um, that alliance is, 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 is based on Russian interest only. And uh, it's quite interesting. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Israeli-Russian um, um, talks that we had. Benjamin Netanyahu just finished talking to Vladimir Putin just an hour ago. But before that, there were some more intense meetings uh, in Amman, Jordan. And what we found out is that the Israelis and the Russians reached an agreement that all the Iranians and Hezbollah forces will not only not take part of the coming Syrian uh, operation in southern Syria, but they will be evacuated from the entire area of anything close to Israel. It's amazing because the, the Russians are right now declaring, saying to the world, any non-Syrian forces should be evacuated completely which is a great victory to the effort of Israel to push Iran away from our borders. People are saying, Amir, on one hand you say that Syria is the place where Iran and, and Russia and Turkey are forming their alliance. How come Russia is now taking the Israeli side and not the Iranian side? It's very, very simple. And Prime Minister Netanyahu said that even better in his um, interview to Judge Janine on Fox News. He said, the Russians want the Iranians as their friends so they can sell them weapons, but not so they will have to deal with them on Syrian soil. Russia came to Syria to take spoils. And they, once they cannot do it in Syria, they'll try to do it in Israel, according to Ezekiel. But they're saying that out in the open. We want the gas and oil of Syria. The problem is that right now, 80% of the oil is in the hands of the area that is dominated by the United States. A couple months ago, there was a great assault of roughly four to 500 Russian private military. Uh, uh, you're talking about mercenaries. that they, they started a great assault on American units and the oil fields over there. America, within a very, in a very decisive act, unlike Benghazi, by the way, America killed more than 200 of that private army. You understand? The Russian sent more than 200 coffins to Russia. Oh, and, and the Russians never admitted that because it's a private army. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it's called Wagner, and it's not enlisted as soldiers of Russia. The, the Russians said, we were, we were not there. Where in reality, not only that they were there, they were trying to use that group of the Wagner private army, which are all ex-elite forces in Russia, and they try to use them to take over those oil fields and gas fields. Amazing, amazing thing. Right now, the Americans don't admit that they are ruling that area, and the Russians don't admit that they're about to or try to take over that. So Russia is facing big problems with taking the spoils. And the last thing they need is to deal with another major player, such as Iran, on Syrian soil. Russia wants Iran in Iran. Russia wants to sell weapons to Iran to defend Iran. Russia does not need Iran in Syria. So that's why the talks between, Amer between Israel and Vladimir Putin are very good talks because in reality we share the same exact same interest and the interest is very clear. As long as Iran is out of the game we will not topple Assad's regime. We're, we're just saying that. We're telling the Russians, look, there is a Russian, excuse me, there is a Syrian president there. He's the ruler. And if he wants to rule, he better rule. But we are not going to allow Iran calling the shots in Syria. That's 
what happens. So what happens when the Iranians are suffering great political and military losses? They're trying to send orders to Hamas to start his own shenanigans in the southern part of Israel. So this is more or less what's going on right now. Now, allow me also to tell you that um, um, we are having some interesting developments in, um, in um, Europe right now. You guys know that forever I've been talking and teaching that I believe that the Antichrist, according to Daniel's description of both the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, as well as the one who will rule during the 70th week, Daniel was speaking about the same place, the same empire, the same leader. So I believe that that old Roman Empire that destroyed the temple in 70 AD is going to somehow be revived to produce the person who is going to rule during the last week, the last seven years before the return of Christ on earth. So I, I've been saying that forever. I believe that Western Europe is where the Antichrist is going to come. And I also urge you, if you haven't watched it, you have two different messages on our YouTube channel. One is called Europe Ready for the Antichrist, and the other one is Europe Closer to the Antichrist. These are two messages that you need to watch in order to understand what's going on there. But there are problems in Europe. Right now, there are too many members in the EU. Daniel was referring to an alliance of 10 different armies, 10 different countries, 10 horns, by the way, of which three were plucked out. So it's very, very interesting because we see more and more countries that are either not really sharing the same interest of the EU or they want out. Britain wanted out and it is out. And by the way, George Soros is trying to make a move to bring them back. But that, if that's not enough, um, we see now that um, in, in Italy, there was elections last month, and the president of Italy, Sergio Mattarella, um, imposed veto on the new coalition. And, and uh, although this guy is just, just like a queen, he's not really the real acting power there, what basically he said is, I'm not allowing the new finance minister, Paolo Savona, who is a very fierce enemy of the EU. I don't approve him being the finance minister. Basically, the president of Italy didn't want anyone who is against the EU to be in the government, in the coming form government of Italy. Basically, that government now, it cannot be established. The whole government is anti the EU, and they, are, they don't want to stay with the Euro, which they hate so much. And what happened is that, you know, that if, if Italy will come out of the EU, it's the end of the EU. You know, the EU started with the Rome Treaty in 1957. That's why it's very, I think, very symbolic that the, the ancient Roman Empire was revived in a treaty that was signed in Rome in 1957. But but uh, think about it, folks. It's not just that. Um, we're, we're talking about um, stuff that Italy is, is, is going through right now. Um, allow me to just um, take care of the, of the lighting here right now. And um, I want you to know, folks, that um, Italy has a $2.3 trillion debt that um, which is very very bad. Um, it's a hundred and thirty percent of its its uh, gross production, and you know if you have anything more than sixty seventy percent, you're in big trouble. Um, and um, the Italians are just not happy with this. We know that the entire EU was banking on money that will be generated from the Iran deal. We know that for a fact. And um, the Iran deal was crumbling right now. I mean, the, the withdrawal of America uh, caused dozens of European companies to stop all connection with Iran. 
and uh, the clock is ticking uh, to other companies. And we're talking about, you know, Airbus that signed a, 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 an agreement to supply Iran 100 airplanes. Airbus supplied three and decided to cancel uh, the, um, uh, the contract. Um, we're talking about Siemens in Germany, Volkswagen, Daniele, the Italian. We're talking about Marisk, the Danish. We're talking about so many companies, even the, the Swiss bank, BCF. All of them suspended all deals with Iran, all thanks to Donald Trump, the President Trump. And the Europeans are shaking, are trembling from this bold move of President Trump. They don't know what to do because all of their economies are recyclings of debts. And they have several different ideas, um, but um, they really don't know what to do because not even a single deal, European deal, um, will be coming to fruition uh, right now. Add to that that summer is right now uh, started and thousands of thousands of immigrants are now flocking and flowing into Europe. We're talking about seven, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 70,000 people from the beginning of 2018 to May 27th. 70,000 people. And it continues. Before even the real migration uh, 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 period started, we're talking about 60,000 came to Italy, 3,000 to Spain, 7,000 to Greece, even to Cyprus, and it just started. Even Spain itself, from 2016, which 6,000 immigrants now have 21,000 this last year, and it's going to be double this year. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't know what to do. Islamic terrorism continue. We just had an attack in, in France, we had an attack in Germany, and it will continue. And uh, Britain, by the way, everybody were sure that the Brexit will cause the fall of Britain, but Britain seems to do pretty good without it. Um, all those dark predictions of Britain crumbling and falling apart are not really happening um, right now. Adding to that, the tension within the countries between the right wing and the left wing in Germany, in Britain, in France, in Holland, and the immigration is the reason for that. There is great division within countries and between different countries. You clearly, clearly see that it becomes more and more violent and Europe is waiting for a deliverer from this situation right now. So, if you ask me, it is way more calm in Israel than it is in Europe. And if you ask me, they are right now in way bigger problem than we are right at, this, at, at the moment. President Trump says borders should be respected. He is not for any arrangement of borderless countries. Um, you know, that free trade that Germany imposed on the EU and by doing so promoted its own industry, that free trade um, is, is causing now the EU to collapse. And America, according to Trump, is standing firm against countries that are actually doing such thing. And one of the first things, they, 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 they raise the, uh, the taxation on export of, of um, steel and aluminum from the EU to America. And this entire new policy of the U.S. right now is, is really causing the flourishing of American, American industry and the crumbling of the EU. You understand that what this one world government movement did was weakening America and strengthening the, the EU and then causing the EU to be in crisis so then there will be a leader that will be agreed upon all to be the one who should lead that big, big chunk of land and big economy. And, and 
the election of Donald Trump as president of America, I believe, was a big accident to this effort. The effort was actually was centered in America by those elite families that are running behind the scenes, 60% of the world's economy. And they were sure that their candidate, Hillary Clinton, is going to win. They were shocked that the people of America voted against it. And then they started moving their effort back to Europe to choose their people such as Macron. And so you see that um, we have a need uh, in Europe for one leadership. Right now, you're talking about 28 different chains of command in Europe right now. And the EU is about to fall as it is now and become something new under one leader. Under, it's very interesting, but I'm saying that because I'm reading reports written by non-Christians. They have no clue that they're quoting Daniel to me. They have no clue that they're, they're talking Bible prophecy to me. They write their reports about the future of the EU without knowing that they are going to, um, um, they're going to, th without knowing that things are going to shift to that which Daniel saw that is about to happen. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's safe and secure in Israel. The alliance between the Russians and Turks are, is much greater right now than ever before. Iran is, is licking its wounds right now. As we speak, Iranians and Hezbollah forces are leaving southern Syria. They are getting away and away and away from the borders with Israel as per Israel's demand. And we're watching how the Iranians are sitting quietly trying to see when will be the right time for them to respond and to avenge that which we did to them over the last, I don't know, 45 days or so. So we're watching the calm before the storm. And I want you, I beg you all to not grow weary and not feel that you can't take it anymore. You know, this is the era and the age of social media that if you're addicted to it, you can be very, very depressed. One of the reasons, I believe, that, that the media is under so much attack is because they want people to be confused. They want people to grow weary so they will not see what's really going on, and they will not be prepared. And I believe with all of my heart that that which the Bible writes is far more accurate than that which the media is saying about the things that are happening in Israel, in the Middle East, and all around the world. That's why I believe the Lord called me to be boots on the ground here in the land of Israel, here in the Middle East, for the sake of the millions of Christians that are in the dark when it comes to information about what's going on. I believe that the, even the Christian channels are doing a very, very poor job because somehow hysteria and sensationalism is taking over the Internet and frightens the people and scares the people and put people in, in a panic mode. And I just hope that you understand that God is in full control. The words of the prophets have never ever been clearer and easier to understand in light of what we see all around us today. The alliance of Ezekiel is there. The prosperity of Israel is there. The crumbling European Union and the desperation there for a leader is there. Everything is in place. Stick to the Bible. Be a good Berean. Always, always test things with your Bible open and not with your TV open or your computer open. And I want you to understand that the reason why I believe, and I, I said that before and I probably need to say that more and more often, 
I believe that we live in the time of what I call the calm before the storm. And I just want you to understand, folks, that there is a reason why God is allowing that calm to be there. Uh, the first one, of course, is millions of people prayed and God answered that. Second is to prepare the region for the war where Russia, Turkey, and Iran must bleed first and Israel must prosper. See, Ezekiel speaks of Israel's prosperity and he speaks of how they are coming against us to conquer and steal and plunder. So they must be bleeding in order to, to need to plunder what we have. We know that President Trump had to be there in order for Jerusalem to be secured in the hands of Israel for the future when the Antichrist will rise and allow them to build a temple. And we also know that it's time of grace for the saints to occupy, to be watchmen, to get ready for our soon departure. And I want to remind you all that, the, that once the storm comes, it's just as in the days of Noah. You know what? Right now, I, I said that we, the believers, are building our own ark. And the world is just you know, is about the world issues. They party and they, they do their own things. They don't understand why we call for holiness and for holy life and why we are so, you know, we're so into living the life of Christians. Why? Because we're building our ark right now and we're pitching that ark. And interesting, the word pitch in the Hebrew, kofer, means atonement. The blood of Jesus, I believe, is that which is is, is surrounding our life right now. And I do believe with all of my heart that we need to be more into building our ark than into um, dealing with the flood. Now we know, by the way, to be in the calm before the storm, that means that we can see the dark clouds of storm approaching. But we're still on dry land. But once that flood is coming, we will be taken in that ark, <laughs> we're secured, we're, we're, we're lifted up in, in, while others are going through the terrible flood and the terrible judgment of God. So I just want you to understand we definitely live in the days of Noah. We definitely live in perilous times. You know, I do believe things are going to get tougher. I, we see apostasy everywhere. We see the, the moral failure, not of the world, but of the church to deal with the things of God. We see compromise from pulpits all over. We see that the word repent is no longer being taught. We see that the book of Genesis, which is the base for anything that God is actually expecting from people to repent of, is not being taught anymore. The story of creation is not being taught anymore. All of that, this is a great major assault, I believe, on Christianity today from within. It's very interesting how in, in the book of Timothy we were told that antichrists will come from within us. Of course, that is not the antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. But we're seeing that people, our enemies are you know, coming from within. We're also watching... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, In this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, because I've overcome the world. Jesus said that in, in John 16. So we, we need to understand, we were never promised a garden of roses. We are going to see intense attack, and it's going to be darker. You know, when a storm is approaching, it's, it's getting darker and darker and darker. And that's, and although, the Bible says, although it is the night we are of the light. We're not of the darkness. We are the sons of the day. So we need to understand we are in the night. Look, it's turning dark right now. But we are, we have the light of Jesus. And we shine through that darkness. And we must remember that we are not of this world. And we are not to take part of that which is done in the dark here in this world. So I want to encourage all of you to stay strong, 
not to be dragged into unnecessary hysteria and sensationalism, to stick to the Bible and to understand that the Lord is in full control. And when the storm will come to the Middle East, we're out of here. The Bible says that He, God, is going to show Himself to the nations of the world, not to the believers. We're out of here. He doesn't need to show Himself to us. We know who He is. But He is going to be hallowed within Israel so the world will see who He is. That's one of the reasons God is going to allow those vicious plans of the enemy to, to, to be fulfilled. Very, very interesting how God allows them to attack and yet judge them for their attack. Because He understands their coming and hatred towards Israel is not because of me. I may have allowed them to do that, but it's their satanic, diabolic hatred towards Israel because Israel is the people of God. So that is going to happen unless you're born again, Spirit-filled, unless you have the Holy Spirit and you read your Bible. You'll never understand that. You need to be in the Word. You need to be you need to spend time with the Lord. You, you know, reading the Bible without having the Holy Spirit is, is, is not going to help you because it won't make sense to you. But if you have the Holy Spirit, if you are born again, as the Bible says in John 3, 3, then you will not only be able to understand, but also have that peace that surpasses all understanding. So I just wanted you to know all of that. And so... I hope this update helped clearing up the situation in Gaza, in Europe, and in Syria, and make you understand what is really, really going on. I love you all very much. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, we're going to start our Young Adults Tour this year, unlike any year before. We're having, starting from tomorrow, people coming from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the Philippines, Japan, Brazil, Paraguay, Mexico, Canada, U.S., France, Netherlands, and the U.K. We brought young adults from all over the world to see and behold Israel. We want to invest in them. So when they go home, they're not going to be the same, and they're not going to allow the anti-Christ secular educational system to poison them. And it's all thanks to your donations that we're able not only to, to have this tour, but we sponsored 15 of the 50 that are coming from, from those type of things. And we, we want to do more and more of those things. We believe that our money shouldn't go for offices or cars or whatever it is. The money should go directly to investing into people. And that is exactly what we have. So I don't have an office. This is, my, this is my office, the backyard. And I'm using a cell phone as a camera right now. I'm using a, you know, a mic. That's my little mic. $20. I wish things would look better, more professional, but I prefer to invest it in something far greater than, than this. Thank you and we're going to pray the ironic blessing upon everyone and conclude this one. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai pana velecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai pana velecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, may you have the shalom, the peace of God in this crazy world. And it's way crazier because of social media, by the way. In this crazy world, may you have the peace of God, a peace that surpasses all understanding that can only come from the Lord of peace who can give you peace now, everywhere, and at all time. Thank you. God bless you. I love you all. And shalom from Galilee. And throughout the tour, we're going to give you more updates, including those young adults that are going to be not only behind me, but I will try and even show you um, people from all around the world and what they think and what they say about what they are seeing over there. We really want to bring you over here with us 
to give you Bible study on location every day and to just cause you to behold Israel, to understand the times and the seasons in which we live and also to understand the plan of God throughout this nation and this place and this land. God is good and Israel is, is, is the apple of his eye because he is watch, he's looking at everything through that lens of Israel. If you hate Israel, you don't know God. If you support and love Israel, you probably understand the Word of God. The question is, what are you doing? Even if you love them, what are you doing with it? Do you give them the gospel or you just hide it from them? Thank you. God bless you. And Shalom from Galilee.